So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. And, the, and man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In the paths of wickedness are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from them. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Mesa Church of Christ. Such a blessing to be with you all. As you can tell, I uh, have my voice back. So thank you for the texts and for the calls and emails that several of you sent this week. I really, really appreciate that. I did not have COVID, so that's good. Uh, did a quick test in the parking lot of a Walgreens last weekend, and it uh, worked out just fine. So I want to share just a couple of updates with you as we begin. Uh, first of all, I want to let you know that the prayer journal is being moved to the foyer. I think it's out by your uh, family tree out there. And uh, so I just want to let you know it's a little bit more of a convenient location. So please write in that journal intentionally and often. That's going to be a gift to your future preaching minister when he gets here. For those of you who may be returning back to Mesa for the winter months, maybe a new um, concept for you, but uh, we're offering that as a, as a blessing to your future minister once he and his family arrives. The prayer uh, room space is still going to remain available over by the office area, so please keep that in mind as well. I'm so excited Keith Lancaster is going to be here next weekend. So excited. It's going to be an awesome gathering, and I want to make a challenge to our high school students and any college students who may be local Invite your chorus teacher, if you're in chorus, invite them to come and to be here next Saturday afternoon. Or if you're in chorus and you have friends uh, who are in chorus, invite them to come. Uh, very rarely are they going to get the kind of education that they're going to get with somebody of Keith's caliber. Uh, not knocking on your choral teachers, by the way, but uh, Keith is just a, a quintessential professional, and he is a deep, deep believer in Jesus. And so um, invite, your, invite your folks to come. And if you can't sing a lick, come to the seminar anyway. <laughs> it's okay. You can pray for people, you can love on people, you can get water, you can sing off key. One of the things I love about God, I believe, is that God is tone deaf. I believe that. I believe that. He listens much, much more for the heart than he does for the quality of the uh, notes. And so that's a good thing. Um, and also two weeks from today is Mission Sunday, right? I see the banners up along the side here, so praise God for that. And I uh, hope you're preparing your minds and hearts to be actively engaged two weeks from today in Mission Sunday. I will not be here for a couple of Sundays. Uh, some of you may be thinking, yay, that's great. Um, but uh, I'm not going to be here for a couple of Sundays. You guys have got a couple of special Sundays coming up, but I'll be back that third Sunday in November. We'll finish our Ephesians series that Sunday. Today we're just going to kind of paint in some broad brushstrokes and part of the text. And then when I'm back with you for that third Sunday in November, we're going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty. Um, as we read through today's text, you're going to notice a very critical aspect of the Christian faith, and it's the aspect of togetherness. There's a little boy who was afraid of the dark, and his mom wanted him to go out and uh, grab a broom off the back porch, but it was nighttime. And so he said to his mom, I don't want to go out and get the broom because it's dark. And she said, it's okay, sweetie. Just keep in mind that Jesus is, Jesus is there. He's always there. You have nothing to be afraid of. And he looked at his mom. He was kind of confused. And he said, uh, are, you, are you sure Jesus is out there? And yes, I'm sure. Jesus is everywhere, honey. He's, he's always ready to help you every time that you need him. And so the little boy thought about it for a minute, and he, he went to the back door. He kind of cracked it open a little bit, and he peered outside, and he said, Jesus, if you're out there, would you hand me the broom, please? I, I love that story. Love that story. A lot of innocence in that story. 
But what's this little boy longing for? He's longing for reassurance, right? Hey, we're in this together. Some things out there that I'm afraid of. Now I'm going to get a show of hands. Or are there some things out there that you're afraid of right now? Oh, my stars. What a time that we're in, right? What a time that we're in. But we've always been in a time, right? From the beginning of the world. Just go back and read the opening chapters of uh, the creation account in Genesis. And we see that it just didn't take humankind too long to mess up that beautiful plan of God. And it's still God's beautiful plan. And it's still God's beautiful intentions. And one of the things that's so special about it is he has designed it for us to be in this together. And we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning in the first part of chapter 6, this power of togetherness and what it looks like lived out not only in the, the family of God, the church, but in the families that comprise the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So let's start in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wow. That could just be the sermon this morning. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As you think about that verse, it's often easy to overlook it. Because we really like to get to the next section where Paul starts giving advice to husbands and wives. Because we like to say, as spouses to one another, you really need to read this part of Ephesians right here. Okay? But we sometimes race past verse 21 when we realize that we are all called in the body of Christ to have a heart posture of submitting to others. That's putting the needs of others first. That's making sure that we're looking out for everybody else's self-interest before we look out for our own interests. This is language that we see in multiple letters of Paul, and even more importantly than that, that we see in the ministry of Jesus himself, right? Who was willing to go to the cross and submit his will to the will of the Father. So what Paul's asking us to do here is, I just, I want you to be Christ-like. And he goes then into what's called a family code. In this time, these were fairly common not just in the context of Christianity, but there would have been other aspects and contexts where a family code would have been put into place. But he he gets into some nuts and bolts. I want you, all of you, to submit to one another, specifically husbands, wives, slaves, masters. Here's some things I want you to consider. And so this is what he writes. Beginning in verse 22, chapter 5. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, I want to say something about this particular passage. There is a greater context that is in play here. And you may be wondering, by the way, why I have those two passages where Paul is talking to wives and he's talking to husbands. Why do I have those side by side? I want you to notice how many more words are addressed to husbands. About twice as much, right? And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about it in just a second. But when we think about the greater context in which these words are situated, Paul is talking about this occurring in a context of holiness. In a context of holiness. If we go back to the Genesis account that we just read a few moments ago, God designed man for woman and he designed woman for man, right? It's part of God's creation. It was part of the order that God brought to this world so that we could live orderly and so that we could honor God with the way that we live in our households and form our households and what comes out of our households. So we can't say uh, in verse 24, Wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Everything? Honey, I'm sorry, we don't have enough bills, uh, money to pay the bills this month, so I'm going to need you to knock that bank off for me on the corner down there, okay? (laughs) Of course not in everything. Everything in the context of holiness. Church, are you with me? Are you with me? In the context of holiness. And he, he then transitions to husbands, and it's such a beautiful picture that the Lord paints here of what being a man of God in the context of marriage looks like. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Be willing to lay your lives down, husbands, for your wives. 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You do know that if you put the church of our Lord down, you're putting down the very bride himself, right? We need to be careful about what we say about the church and how we speak about the church. I don't know about you. You can insult me pretty big time, right? You start talking about my wife, you're probably going to have some words. We're talking about the wife of Christ, uh, of God, the bride, the, the Jesus him, himself who is the church. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and care for their body just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. We just read that a few moments ago. It's a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And we're going to come back and talk more about the nuts and bolts of this in a couple of weeks. But I just want to put this on the table this morning to help us understand husbands and wives never put each other down in public. Honor one another. You know, husbands and wives do everything you can to outserve one another. You want a great household, you want a God honoring household. Do the best you can to always put your best foot forward, to take care of one another. Let your children see that. Let them see that. Even if you disagree, it's okay. Honor one another when you disagree. It doesn't have to be knocked down, drag out, right? Let's fix this. Let's figure this out. Let's pray through this. Let's go to the Word and see what the Lord's instructing us to do. When your children see that lived out behaviorally, I think it's much being more likely that they're going to have a deeper and abiding faith that's going to stick. Speaking of children... Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. It's the submission language that Paul is using here, submitting uh, to others and the power that is in that, the formative power that is in that. We'll talk more about this a couple of weeks, and I specifically have some questions that I want to ask our teens and our college students, and we're back together at that time. The text continues. Paul just marches through here different ways that we see the, the love of Christ and faith in Christ expressed in the context of family. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. He goes outside the family, uh, still in the context of household, but outside the family unit. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free, and masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him." Some folks look at this passage and they say, well, the Bible's obviously outdated. You can see that it condones slavery. That's totally missing the point of the passage. This, this is not condoning slavery. It's recognizing a context culturally that was in place at that time. And God's response to say, if you really want to boil it down to its essence, there is no such thing as slave and master. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So act like it. Act like a people who belong to Christ Jesus. Here's a key truth that's expressed in the book of Ephesians. The work of Christ in us leads to the work of Christ through us. The work of Christ in us leads to the work of Christ through us. And part of that work that has been done in us is a work of submission. As Christ submitted his will to the will of the Father, we in turn submit our will to the will of the Father. And that's when it becomes much, much more about other people. Every once in a while, I come across a resource that just really helps crystallize things for me, that helps bring things into focus. And several years ago, I mentioned this study to you. There was a, a trilogy of books that came out by James Bryan Smith. Uh, one of those books was called The Good and Beautiful Community. He has a wonderful expose on Ephesians 5 uh, in, that, in that book, and, and I just want to share a few quotes with you. I don't often do this, quote authors at length, but I want to this morning just share a, a little bit of insight that he shares because I think it is so profound as he talks about what a good and beautiful 
community looks like. So as we reflect on these words that we just read, this household code, this idea of submitting to one another in the body of Christ, a few things that I want to draw your attention to. First, when he describes the serving community, he points out a false narrative that's really important for us to understand. This is the narrative that Satan puts into place. First of all, our needs matter most. My needs matter most. It's a false narrative. Notice what he writes. One of the most dominant narratives is built on self-preservation, personal happiness, and making sure our needs are met. This narrative is not only for individuals, it can be the foundation for a community. Now, let's stop there just a second, and I want us to think about this. We know this in our heads, right, to be a false narrative. We know it. We know this in our hearts to be a false narrative. Think about this. How many great love ballads were written about you? Would it have gone to the top of the charts if many years ago the song would have gone like this? I am so beautiful to me. Who in the world is going to buy that? Roll it forward a few years later. I would catch a grenade for me? That doesn't even make sense. Well, first of all, I would catch a grenade for you doesn't even make sense, okay? For you Bruno Mars fans out there. But anyway, it doesn't make sense. The great ballads, the great love songs, the great love stories are about others. The willingness to lay down our lives for others. But there's this false narrative out there. No, at the end of the day, it's really all about me. Smith continues, there's nothing wrong with loving the community of Christ followers who have nurtured you and perhaps your family for many years. And there's nothing wrong with wanting things to go well for your church and its ministry. The problem comes when the most important consideration, the dominant desire, and the main focus of a community is its own success. Now, I want you to see how this plays out. Just as an individual whose life is focused on meeting his or her own needs becomes narcissistic, self-centered, ineffective, and ultimately unhappy, so also communities can become so focused on themselves that they lose their souls. And when this happens, the larger vision, the one that brought the community into existence, has been eclipsed and the community no longer exists to fulfill its original mission, but to simply stay alive. This is often the first step towards spiritual death and ultimately the demise of community. This is what happens when a church turns inward. When a church starts focusing on itself more than focusing on others. But Smith doesn't stop there. He offers a true narrative. And that true narrative is others' needs matter most. So he talks about in this uh, good and beautiful community two churches. There was a church that he was doing some work with and they were very frustrated They had some college students who were coming to Bible class, enjoying that time of fellowship, but they weren't moving from Bible class into the worship assembly. And so uh, some folks in the church began to complain, and uh, those kids are going to go to Bible class, they need to be in worship, and so ultimately they just completely walked away. There was another church that had a lot of college students in the area, but they weren't coming to the church. And this was a church that was actually aging, and they were graying, and... um, It's kind of getting smaller by attrition. And so they asked his counsel and said, what should we do? And he said, well, what what are you really good at? He said, well, we're really good at cooking. (laughs) And he said, well, you know what? College kids love to eat. And so they started just preparing meals for college kids on, uh, I think it was on like a Wednesday night or inviting some of the kids over for lunch. And that church actually began to grow. Because there was this tipping point in the church's future when it became much more about physical food. And it became much more about feeding people spiritually. So he asked this question. What was the difference between the two churches? The first church was asking the question, what can we do to improve our church? The second church was asking, how can we serve others? 
The first church was operating from a narrative of self-focus. The second was operating from a narrative of focusing on others. And I think he's on to something here. Because I think when we start to turn outward, it's not that we abandon inward focus. We always need to take care of each other. That's just always part of the equation. But if that's our primary focus, then we're not even participating in the Great Commission at that point. He says, communities become other-centered when they are steeped in the narrative of the kingdom of God. They know that their community is an outpost of the kingdom, a place where grace is spoken and lived for as long as it is needed. The value of a church is not its, in its longevity, but in its love. The success of a church is not in its size, but its service. We are a people founded by a person who never established a church or built a building or led a finance campaign. Our leader just came and served and then died for the good of others. And I love this observation. I suppose that would make a pretty good mission statement for a church, but one I am not likely to see. We exist to serve others and then die just like our founder. Okay? So if you think about the book of Ephesians... And the journey that we've been on these past several weeks, particularly as we think about chapters 1 through 5, the grace that has been extended to us, we extend that to others. We don't hoard that for ourselves. And so I close our broad brushstroke time with you this morning with two challenges for you um, this week. There's two things I'm going to ask you to do and, and, and practice these things between now and the next time that we're together, just to see what God does. So, first of all, I want to ask you to practice submitting to one another. Just practice. Um, teenagers, when, you're, when your parents ask you, I need you to clean your room, practice submitting to one another. I got an amen out of that one, all right. <laughs> Honey, could you help me with the dishes? Practice submitting to one another. Start in the small things. Start in the small things. When your elders ask you to, fill in the blank, and again, in the greater context of holiness, then do what your elders ask you to do. If a neighbor needs help, if a brother or sister could use some assistance, practice submission. Because in doing so, we model the very heart of Jesus himself, who submitted to the will of the Father. Secondly, I would like to ask you to prayerfully process this question. What kind of church do you want to be? Do you want to be a serve us church? Or do you want to be a serve others church? And I'm just going to ask you to wrestle with that for a couple of weeks. And we get back together a few weeks, we'll kind of see how you did as you process that and wrestled with that. I want to close our sermon today with a prayer for today by an organization called Al-Anon. It's a worldwide fellowship that offers a program of recovery for family and friends of alcoholics. And Al-Anon is an others-focused organization to put the right tools in, in various individuals' toolboxes so that they can get through these devastating times and the devastating impact of uh, alcoholism. But I just want you to hear the words of this prayer. I think it makes a great prayer, a prayer for all believers. They pray, Lord, Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh God, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. 
And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. We're going to share a song together. If you have something you want to say to the church this morning, you've got an opportunity to have a conversation with a couple of your elders. If you want to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in this place and be baptized, have your sins washed away, start your life afresh and you submitting to the will of Christ Jesus. If there's anything else on your heart, we're going to give you an opportunity to share that now as we're going to stand together and we're going to sing together. We are the sad.